office and health promotions at the American Lung Association. And welcome to our interstitial lung disease webinar for newly diagnosed patients. Um, and this webinar was made possible today by the support of Bo Ringer Engelheim. Thank you. So the American Lung Association's mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. Our vision is a world free of lung disease. Um, so today, after this call, our learner outcomes are to gain a better understanding of what interstitial lung disease is and how it impacts the body, identify treatment options available for managing symptoms and preventing complications, and to find resources and support. Um, just so folks know, we will not have a Q&A today, uh, but if you do have any questions, please direct them to the American Lung Association helpline. So I want to introduce our speakers. Today we will hear from Dr. Erica Brand from the University of California, San Francisco. Um, Dr. Brand is a pulmonologist and critical care physician who specializes in diagnosing and managing advanced lung diseases. Her primary interest is in caring for patients with interstitial lung disease throughout their journey. Her research focuses on how to improve the delivery of high quality, safe and effective care in ILD, by working closely with patients, care caregivers, and clinicians, and the health systems to reimagine how to deliver care to individuals with ILD. She is particularly interested in the use of digital health and technology and health informatics to enhance how we collect and use meaningful information to diagnose, monitor, and manage advanced lung disease. She earned her medical degree at Columbia University's Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons, where she also completed a residency in internal medicine. She completed a fellowship in pulmonology and critical care medicine at UCSF before joining the faculty. She has co-directed the UCSF ILD program since 2019, and we're very excited to have her on today. We will also hear from our patient storyteller, Laura R. So Laura is from the New England area, and prior to her diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, she was a senior admin assistant at, the, at a large insurance company. She enjoys sharing her story as a way to help others. She's a mother of three, grandmother of six, and great-grandmother of three as well. Now retired, Laura lives with her daughter and grandpups and enjoys spending time with her friends, family, and traveling up the coast to Maine. Before we do get started, though, I just want to give Laura a chance to introduce herself, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Ferrand. Hi. My name is Laura and I have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and I'll be sharing my journey with you later on. Thanks. Great, thank you, Laura. And now Dr. Fran, I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura, do you mind just checking? I think this may not be the most recent slide set that I shared with you this morning. I just I just changed it. Um, are you not seeing your notes? Um, just see some. All right. Well, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, Laura, thank you for um, being here with us today and for being willing to share your story. As a fellow mother of three and dogs, I uh, was thrilled to hear about the legacy you have and support system you have. And so um, this conversation will be much enriched from by hearing from your perspective. Um, my goal really is to help um, talk about the process of diagnosing and understanding interstitial lung disease. I see a lot of newly di diagnosed patients in my role as co-director of our ILD program at UCSF and understand what an overwhelming uh, part of the journey it can be. And so this is really, the goal here is to kind of demystify that process and try to provide everyone with a solid foundation of understanding what interstitial lung disease is and how we go about classifying it, diagnosing it, and what is our framework for management. So let's just start with what is interstitial lung disease. Uh, the term really is an umbrella 
term that refers to a group of over 200 lung conditions that cause a variety of inflammation and or scarring in the lung tissue, which we just we refer to as the interstitium. And these diseases, all, although very varied, uh, share sort of a core uh, number of features, and those include clinical symptoms, so how patients present, with how they experience the diseases, uh, the changes that we see in lung imaging, changes to lung function, so how the lungs actually move air in and out and exchange gas, and then also changes in pathology. So if we were to take a piece of the lung and look under at it under the microscope, there are commonalities in the patterns of injury that we see. That inflammation and scarring that these interstitial lung diseases cause, which I'm gonna to refer to as ILD going forward, interfere with both how the lungs function and how oxygen is able to move in the lungs once it gets in there. Lung inflammation to varying extents can be reversed, but lung scarring uh, up for, for the time being, for the foreseeable future, is not reversible. And so treatment really depends on our ability to diagnose people early, inter intervene early, and the success of treatment, how we define success, really depends on the mix of inflammation and scarring and the severity uh, at the time of diagnosis. So healthy lungs, you take in a big breath of air, you're able to move air into your lungs really well. And then when you exhale, you're able to move air out of your lungs very well. And then once the air gets into the lungs, it also needs to get where it needs to go, which means it needs to go travel through the airways, get to the very uh, sacs at the end of those airways, which are called alveoli, and then cross the sacs cross the interstitium, which is the lung tissue, and get to the blood vessels. The oxygen needs to get from the alveoli to the blood vessels, and the carbon dioxide needs to get from the blood vessels uh, to the alveoli. There are a number of different categories of diseases for lung disease. I think most people are most familiar with diseases like COPD or asthma. These are diseases that primarily affect the airways, beginning with the your main wind, windpipe or trachea where you bring air in and extending all the way through those airways as they branch into smaller and smaller uh, tubes. There's also diseases that affect the lining of the lung known as the pleura, diseases that affect the blood vessels, those are things like pulmonary hypertension, which can change the how, what the pressures are like in your blood vessels, particularly in your lungs. And then there are interstitial lung diseases that primarily affect the lung tissue or interstitium. I found this on the web. There are a number of category, uh, ways of categorizing interstitial lung disease. The, you know, we mentioned early on there, that there are over 200 types. So how we organize those types, there are different approaches to doing so. But I think a very um, approachable way of organizing them is to put them into three big buckets. And this is what, the way I talk to patients about it when they come in to see me. The first big bucket is exposures to something in the environment. And that can be act, act, things that are actually in the environment, uh, dust, fumes, mold or mildew, uh, down pillows or comforters, bird feathers, et cetera. They can be medications, um, or could, they can be things like smoking uh, from tobacco use. Um, the second big bucket is autoimmune related. So this is your body recognizing something in itself as foreign and reacting and trying to get rid of it. And sometimes the lungs can be involved. Diseases that fall into this category that many people have heard of are rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Other examples are scleroderma, myositis, Sjogren's. And then the third big bucket is idiopathic, which is a fancy word for an unknown cause. 
And the most common disease in this bucket is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the most common interstitial lung disease overall. And each of these groups present differently, they um, are managed differently, and their prognosis is different, which is why it's really important to get an accurate diagnosis up front. And when we see someone in clinic, our first real job is to try to see, can we get you down into one or two of these buckets? And then what additional tests do we need to really narrow even further? Patients with interstitial lung disease, regardless of the bucket, have a lot of really common symptoms, which is what drives people to present to the doctor. The most common of which are feeling short of breath, particularly with activity, and as the disease progresses, feeling increasingly short of breath, both with activity and at rest. A dry cough, so some patients will have a cough where they bring stuff up, but many patients just describe a, a persistent dry cough. Chest discomfort, some patients will have bleeding in their lungs, known as hemoptysis, loss of appetite, unexplained weight loss, and then other general symptoms of fatigue, feeling run down, and then muscle, joint, or skin symptoms. And the presence or absence of these symptoms can sometimes help us get early clues into which of those buckets you may fall into. The process of diagnosing ILD, we're going to now explore further and kind of go through each of the categories of information that we really try to collect. But I think it's important to recognize, recognize that di diagnosing ILD can be really complex. It requires that we gather, review, interpret, and kind of put together a lot of different pieces of information. And unfortunately, because the symptoms of ILD are not specific to ILD, but really can be seen in many other conditions, including more common lung conditions like COPD, there's often delays in diagnosis where patients are thought to have something else going on, thought to have asthma or COPD or, or pneumonia for a long period of time before the ILD is recognized. And those delays in diagnosis can really impact the overall prognosis and the treatment options. It's also really important, despite the fact that it's really complex and can take time, it is really important to get an accurate diagnosis. We've mentioned this already, but there's really significant variation in how these diseases progress, how they present, how we manage them, what other um, complications we need to think about and evaluate for. And so really getting a specific diagnosis is the best way to allow your medical team to, to come up with an individual, individualized medical management plan that is gonna be most successful for you. And so trying to get uh, to a specific answer, a specific diagnosis, not just interstitial lung disease, but which of those buckets do you fall into? And within the bucket, which of those specific diagnoses do you have is really foundational to uh, the best management plan. So now let's go through the pieces of information that we collect to, to aid us in making that uh, diagnosis. The first thing is really clinical history. If you have seen an interstitial lung disease doctor before, you know that we ask an incredible number of questions. I always caveat this at the beginning of an evaluation with a new patient that I am going to ask a ton of questions up front, but there is a method to that madness. We really are trying to understand what are those things in your history that you've been exposed to or that may increase your risk for developing an ILD or a specific type of ILD. And those include age, gender, smoking history, family history, a really detailed occupational history and environmental history. And that includes sort of what your hobbies are, where you've worked, where you've traveled, um, what sort of dusts and chemicals and uh, environmental 
both indoor and outdoor exposures have been part of your history. We want to know what medications you have seen in the past and any history, either personal or family history, of autoimmune diseases. Understanding what symptoms you have, how long those symptoms have been present, and how they have changed over time are also important clinical clues. The second piece is a physical exam, and this has looked differently um, during COVID and post-COVID as we have done, as increasingly centers have done more telehealth visits and have done um, initial visits over video, and we are learning more about how to do a good exam over video. But ultimately, um, we really want to have a good listen to your lungs, and when we're listening to the lungs, we're trying to evaluate for crackles, which are a physical sign um, that we can hear that correlates with scarring in the lungs. We want to examine your joints and your skin and your muscle strength, which may give clues for um, an underlying autoimmune disease. And then another big clue we look at is clubbing in the fingers, which is sort of a curvature in the nail bed, which often happens in patients whose oxygen levels have been low for long periods of time. That's sort of a physical indicator that that's been going on. So we get a clinical history, we do a physical exam, we often get blood work. There are a number of different studies that we're looking for when we do our blood work. The first are autoimmune serology. So again, thinking about that bucket of autoimmune diseases, these are blood tests that are um, focus on detecting antibodies that can be associated with specific autoimmune diseases and can help us to understand if there is an underlying connective tissue disease that we know is associated with an interstitial lung disease. There are also biomarkers, and there are a number of different biomarkers, but there are serum biomarkers, with, which specifically refers to uh, molecules that can be found in the blood that have been shown to support the evaluation of patients, either in assessing their risk for ILD and helping to make a specific diagnosis of ILD or, in, or indicating a specific disease course or an overall prognosis. In general, biomarkers still really remain in the research space, but translating and implementing biomarkers into the clinical space is an area of active discovery. And the last area of blood work um, that we often consider are, is genetic testing. And this is an area that we are really, our knowledge of the role of genetics is really exploding. But genetic testing can really improve our understanding of how genetic risks impact the development, the progression, and the management of ILD. And understanding how to incorporate this into our clinical workup is also an area of active investigation. Imaging is really sort of the, probably the most important piece of information we get uh, during our diagnostic evaluation. A chest X-ray is often sort of the, the first entry into uh, uh, ILD imaging, but it doesn't provide the level of detail that is often needed to distinguish between ILD and ILD mimickers, and more importantly, to distinguish between types of ILD. In order to do that, we really need a CT scan, and ideally a high resolution CT scan, which really can show the different patterns of damage in the lungs and changes, into, and changes in the lung tissue, and really help to guide a specific uh, diagnostic assessment. When we look at a CT scan, the images from a CT scan, many people think CT scans are an answer box. Unfortunately, they are not, but what they do show us is the different uh, types of injury that are present, and we can identify those different features, and they often will kind of combine into a pattern, and different patterns are more or less associated with different diagnoses. And so at a very high level, what we're looking for are evidence of inflammation injury in the lungs. Those are things like, I put, we have the terms here because 
Um, you will see these terms in your CT scan reports if you look at them, but those are terms like ground glass, nodules, consolidation. Um, we look for evidence of scarring, reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, honeycombing. We look at where the disease is present. Is it present more in the middle of the lung, the outside of the lung, or both? Is it present more at the top of the lung, the middle of the lung, the bottom of the lung, or throughout? And then we look for the presence of additional findings, cysts, or different attenuation, meaning how dark the lung looks. Sometimes we'll also ask for um, a, diff a different um, um, maneuvers during a CT scan. We'll ask for patients to take a big breath out in and then take pictures as they exhale, or we'll ask you to flip onto your stomach to take a pi pictures of the lungs then. And sometimes we'll add dye to the CT scan to specifically look at the um, pulmonary vasculature for evidence of emboli. All of that can add to a, the overall assessment of the imaging depending our, on our suspicion for um, which different buckets may be at play. Breathing tests uh, or pulmonary function tests really help us to assess both the pattern of the breathing limitations, whether you have trouble taking air in, that's a restriction, getting air out, obstruction, or gas getting across the lungs uh, once, once it does get in. And that pattern of breathing limitations can really help, again, suggest one type of diagnosis over another. It can also suggest that there may be additional problems to the interstitial lung disease. And most importantly, it can really help us understand the severity of lung disease um, and estimate prognosis and progression in response to therapy. Pulmonary function tests are sort of the mainstay of how we evaluate uh, interstitial lung disease over time, getting serial measurements. We're really interested in knowing how is the lung function changing over time and how are the interventions, how we're managing the interstitial lung disease uh, changing lung function or um, moderating lung function. Some additional non-invasive diagnostic tests that we may suggest are a six minute walk test. That really is our best way of assessing how is somebody functioning with their interstitial lung disease? How well can they move um, with this lung disease present? And sometimes paired with that will be an assessment of oxygen. When you're sitting still, are your oxygen levels okay? Great. What about when you move? Are the oxygen levels still okay? What about when you're sleeping? Are they still in a safe range? These are all parts of the assessment. Often at the beginning, um, uh, in terms of in, in part with the diagnostic evaluation, but certainly part of our serial assessment as the disease progresses over time. And then sometimes when we're kind of thinking about considering someone who may have, have both a lung disease and heart disease, and we're not sure whether the shortness of breath is really being driven by one more than the other, an exercise test can help us to sort that out. So that's really kind of an overview of the non-invasive testing we do. And the goal is to try to reach a diagnosis based on non-invasive testing alone. But sometimes that's not possible, meaning we kind of collect all of that information and we're still uncertain what is the primary diagnosis. And if that is the case, we will consider moving on to invasive testing. And there are really two uh, big types of invasive, invasive testing. The first is what's called a bronchoalveolar lavage or a BAL. Uh, uh, this is accomplished by using a bronchoscope which goes down through your mouth, into your airway, and down into your lungs. And so we're inside of the airways, the lung tubes. And it allows us to first take a look around, make sure that those airways um, and the lining of those airways look okay. And then we can do things like put out a little bit of fluid into the lungs and suck it right back up. And when we do, we grab cells that are, into, are in the lung and we can look at those under the microscope. And the, the balance of cells that we see um, can 
suggest, again, one type of lung disease versus the other. It's We're rarely able to make a diagnosis alone based on a BAL, but it can help us in combination with other data to make a diagnosis. We can sometimes also put a needle out into the lung tissue and grab part of that interstitium, that lung tissue, and look at that under the microscope. We're only able to grab small pieces of tissue that way, and so it's often not enough to make a diagnosis. And so if we are thinking that lung tissue is gonna be necessary, the recommendation is for a lung biopsy, either a surgical lung biopsy or a cryobiopsy, depending on the expertise at your center. And ultimately, we take all of that information and at expert care centers, uh, we review all of that information in what is called a multidisciplinary conference, which allows experts from different disciplines to review the data together and come to a consensus on what we believe the diagnosis is. We will also, as part of that evaluation, sometimes think about consulting with additional specialists. This may include a geneticist, if we think genetic testing is indicated, a rheumatologist, if we're concerned about an underlying autoimmune disease, sometimes a cardiologist, if we're thinking about complications from your lung disease, like pulmonary hypertension, um, and others. All with the goal of trying to get to a strong and confident diagnosis and to come up with a personalized management plan. So that was really an overview of the different categories of information that we use to arrive at a diagnosis. And I hope it gives you a sense of how complex this is and how much information gathering is really required to accurately evaluate someone who we suspect of having ILD. And so now I wanna briefly touch on what do we do with that information once we have it. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about both the management and treatment of ILD. Overall, the recovery or the disease progression, how we approach managing your ILD really depends on the specific ILD diagnosis and the severity of the disease. We can generally think about two big categories of management, pharmacologic management and non-pharmacologic management. And we often focus a lot on pharmacologic management, but both of those are really important. Pharmacologic management, we can really put into, um, categorize in, based on how those medications um, act. The first are anti-inflammatory medications. These are medications, again, if we see a lot of inflammation on the CT scan, or we uh, diagnose you with a disease that we know is driven by inflammation, then the goal is really to calm down inflammation in the body, calm down inflammation in the lungs, and we use anti-inflammatory medications to do that. The second category of medications are antifibrotic medications, and we use these for diseases that are primarily scarring diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or for diseases that have progressed to a, to a point where they are behaving like IPF, meaning they are can, causing progressive scarring. Um, and in those diseases, we really wanna focus on slowing down the development of new scar. We can't reverse scar that is there, but the goal is to really slow down the development of new scar. In addition to treating the primary interstitial lung disease, we also recognize that patients with ILD have a high symptom burden. And so thinking about what medications can be used to improve quality of life, improve how people live with interstitial lung disease by reducing their cough burden or reducing their shortness of breath is really important to overall quality of life. And then thinking about the treatment of comorbidities. And that is often done with medications, particularly if we're thinking about patients who have a lot of reflux or have pulmonary hypertension or have COPD or asthma in addition to their interstitial lung disease. And we, we understand that taking these medications can be really challenging, that the, the regimen can get complex, particularly as you're balancing that with other conditions. And so it's important to make sure that you're taking the medications 
the right medications at the right time. So really having a process for staying organized, setting up a system that can help you communicate and track your medications and keep track of any side effects that you are experiencing and, and communicating that with your care team is really important so that those medications can be adjusted so that you can tolerate them and so that they're accomplishing ultimately what our goal is, which is to improve your overall health by managing your disease and reducing the symptom burden. I think if you don't take anything else away from this conversation, I want you to really remember the importance of oxygen therapy in lung disease in general and also in interstitial lung disease. Um, oxygen therapy can make breathing and exertion easier. It also is really important in protecting you from the complications that happen when your oxygen levels drop below 88. And so we are always trying to keep your oxygen levels in a safe zone. And if we know that you're going to engage in activities where your oxygen levels drop, then we wanna make sure that we adjust your oxygen before you do those activities. Always trying to keep your oxygen in a safe range. Beyond just sort of those physical benefits, there's also the added benefits that a safe oxygen level is really good for improving your sleep and reducing anxiety um, that can be driven or worsened by low oxygen levels. Pulmonary rehab. Um, so we, sorry, we have a transition to the non-pharmacologic management. So we've talked about oxygen. Now we're talking about pulmonary rehab. The goals here are really to think holistically about your care. And we want patients to remain active. We want your overall health and strength and engagement in day-to-day -day life activities to remain as high as possible. And pulmonary rehab is a tool by which we can provide additional education about how to do that and also provide a graduated plan to try to get your exercise and overall fitness up to the best place it can be um, while doing that safely. So understanding what parameters do we need to pay attention to while we're increasing our exercise. Not to mention that exercise is good for your overall mental and emotional health and pulmonary rehab connects you to others who are also working with, living with lung diseases and that's an additional um, source of support. So what's next? Well, you are here because you either have been diagnosed with interstitial lung disease or a loved one or friend has been, or you're concerned about ILD. And so the very first step is to connect with a provider about that and to find a doctor with ILD experience. These are rare conditions and so can be very challenging to diagnose and manage. And so getting a second opinion from someone with ILD expertise will aid in your overall diagnostic and management plan. And it's important to be ready for those visits by kind of reflecting on what we've discussed today, reflecting on your own personal and lit lived experience and having questions ready for that visit. You, we want to protect your lungs. And so while we're going through the diagnostic process and after you've been diagnosed throughout your sort of life, your journey um, with interstitial lung disease, we wanna also think about protecting your lungs from other sources of injury. And so if you're smoking or exposed to secondhand smoke exposure, um, working hard to quit and limit that exposure is really important. Being aware that infections is sort of an added injury to your lung and so really taking additional precautions to avoid infections and be mindful of additional insults to your lungs that you may be less able to tolerate and that includes impacts of climate change and changes to air quality, um, indoor and outdoor irritants and pollutants, um, and thinking about how your overall health and fitness, nutrition, exercise regimen can support your um, ILD journey. 
Then finally, I want to mention that we know that this is a life-changing diagnosis for many people and that the visits that you have with ILD experts are really often focused on trying to get to a diagnosis and come up with a management plan. But we also want you to live well with ILD. And that requires really tapping in to a support network, either one that you already have or ones that exist through the ILD community and being able to share your diagnosis, share your feelings, your experience, and connecting with others who have been through this who can provide guidance um, on how to navigate living with interstitial lung disease. We know that the, many of these diseases will progress over time, that they will have an, in, an increasing impact on uh, your overall quality of life and ability to function. And so in addition to connecting with support groups and loved ones, there are also doctors who focus on symptom management and palliation of symptoms. And that can be really an important part of the disease management, even early on in the diagnosis, because we recognize some people have a really high symptom burden even early on. And with that sort of framework, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, who can tell us about her personal journey with IPF. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, as I said before, I have been diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And as um, Dr. Ferrand was talking, I kept writing down more and more things as to, oh yeah, based on your, on your slides. But in 2006, so I'm going back further than, um, than of course, than today, which is many years in, in the field of interstitial lung diseases because it was harder then than it is today that they have learned so much more. But in 2006, I was having problems coughing. My breathing, I, I don't remember my breathing, my being short of breath, but I do remember the cough really bad. I was a power walker and I couldn't do that. So I went to a pulmonary doctor who, um, it was, who didn't diagnose me with an ILD. He just said that I had onset of asthma or um, then he put me on inhalers. And I went through that for about six or seven years before it kept getting worse and I decided that I was going to try to find another physician that could, um, I was frustrated because the cough kept getting worse. So I did find another pulmonary doctor eventually in uh, 2013 and that doctor decided to do a VATS biopsy, which is a video assisted lung biopsy. Um, and confirmed that I had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Before he did the biopsy, he told me that he felt that he would suspect that I, I, would, I had that. So he confirmed that I had that. Sort of looked at me at the time and said, I'm terribly sorry. And you know, it's a life sentence, really. Um, you have a terminal disease. At that time, there was no medication for it and there of course is no cure so i was pretty devastated it was very difficult to um, talk to my family and friends at that time because it was hard for them it was hard for me to understand let alone them so what i decided to do instead of wallowing in my own um in my own self um i decided to do some research which I did online. I found a couple of websites and blogs and maybe some of you have heard of them and one of them is Inspire, which is um, a website that the American Lung Association um, is part of. And I went into the disease or the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis section of that and started reading some blogs, started reading some information from other people who had been diagnosed with IPF, who um, were doing certain treatments for it, were telling me what, um, what 
they would suggest what I should do. And part of that was to go to a center of excellence, which which is really, as the doctor was talking about, is specialists in, in um, interstitial lung diseases. I live in the state of Connecticut, so I'm pretty lucky that I have um, a center of excellence or a COE here in, um, in the state, which is Yale New Haven Hospital and their critical pulmonary care center. And I went there and I, I decided early on that I was going to fight whatever, you know, I was going to just in my own mind, it was, well, you know, I'm going to show this doctor that this isn't what he thinks it is. And I went to Yale. Um, they looked at all the slides that were given to them. They did determine, yes, I did have, inter I had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. And they told me, they gave me some options. They gave me not hope, but options of things that I could do. And so I went into a clinical trial. I decided that I was going to start doing whatever I could for me and for anybody else that um, may end up having this disease. And, and through this whole process, I still got my support from the blogs and the websites and Inspire and the other people that were out there and I would blog and I would tell them how I was feeling and they would really tell me how they were feeling and I didn't feel alone in this whole process. I went when I went to Yale, um, there were clinical trials and there still is clinical trials that are being run on medication that may help um, our disease. And so I went into a clinical trial. I decided that if that wasn't going to help me, at least maybe it could help somebody else at that point. And I really was in that clinical trial for four years. I immediately went to pulmonary rehab. I made sure that that was one of the things that I did so that I could stay strong. I was put on oxygen right away. Um, and it made me, pulmonary rehab really made me feel like I still was me. It made me feel like I could still do things. I wasn't tied to an oxygen tank that was sitting in my home. I could go ahead and I could go out and I could do the things that I wanted to. It was difficult at first to go on oxygen mentally because I didn't want to walk around with this um, tank or with, a, a, you know, a portable oxygen concentrator. I, I just didn't want to go out with that. But people were telling me, which is true, um, that it really wasn't for my lungs at that point. It was to keep the rest of my organs going, which, you know, is what the oxygen was for because my lungs, um, as much as they could take in, was helping my heart and my kidneys and my other organs. So that really helped me in um, in wearing it and not, and, and in addition to that, I just decided that I was going to make it not so bad for me. And I had my, um, my, my wheels painted and, and, um, and I had, you know, the tanks all dressed up. So for me, it wasn't as bad. I know that not everybody would do that, but that was something that I did. I decided that, you know, in the blogs, I became a member of an organization that um, that collected data. In addition to that, they asked me if I would go to uh, the FDA and talk to the FDA about what it was like being um, a person who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. My dogs are running down the stairs. I apologize if they start barking <laughs> any moment now, right? So I did. I was one of four patients that went to, um, or one of four people who had IPF that went to the FDA and talked to them about two particular drugs that were currently um, out to hopefully be approved by the FDA, which they were, which um, are the two drugs, Espria and OFEV, that are now on the market. I think they're still the only two that are out there. Um, I went to conferences. I went to workshops that the American Lung Association had. I went everywhere that I could and I did webinars so that I could um, know. I, I became so knowledgeable 
for myself in IPF and in interstitial lung disease is that I just had to know to help me understand what was going on inside me. And then I decided that I, I was going to um, pursue the lung transplant. That was really the only treatment that I felt for me was the best thing to do. And as I said previously, I am, am lucky to live in the state of Connecticut. I'm in between two very good states, which is New York, Columbia Presbyterian, uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia Hospital and Boston Brigham Women's Hospital, which is now part of Mass General. Um, those two had lung transplants, and I, I went. I was evaluated by both, and eventually, in um, December of 2016, I was listed with Eunice with um, both New York Press and. Um, Boston Brigham Women's Hospital. So I was multi-listed for a transplant. I, at the time, was also still going um, with my trusty little tanks on playing on trains um, to Washington, D.C., and I was still a uh, patient advisor um, on interstitial lung diseases. So I went to CMS and some other places. I also did some UConn Medical School speaking, and I did all that because I wanted to get the word out. It was still a very uh, um, new thing. People still weren't talking about interstitial lung diseases as they are today, which I'm really grateful for. So I wanted to get the word out as much as I could. Um, I had, I was lucky enough to have a lung transplant. I had a left lung transplant in um, January of 2017, so I'm six years and six months out from that. And so I'm, you know, I was, I went right back to pulmonary rehab about two months after I had my transplant and my pulmonary rehab or the, the respiratory therapist said that, you know, you're gonna do, you're gonna do a 5K and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I just had a lung transplant. But eight months post-transplant, I did. They came and um, with the respiratory therapists, I did my first 5K and have done quite a few since then. So for me, anyway, it has turned out to be a wonderful thing. As I said, I'm six years out. That was, um, that was the thing that worked for me. And so... I kept doing that and I, I kept doing other things until um, COVID hit. And then when COVID hit and the pandemic started, I, um, I of course, everybody had stopped doing as much as possible when it came to um, going places. Today, post pandemic and um, post lung transplant, six and a half years later, I've slowed down a little. I still share and speak like today as much as I can to give back to others and to help others with my knowledge and to tell them where um, to go to a center of excellence and to see doctors that specialize in the disease so that they can be diagnosed properly and to also um, get the, the best treatment that would work for them. Um, I was thinking today just before I came on and I know that maybe it might sound crazy, but I'm sort of grateful for IPF because one, I was diagnosed with it that, um, and, and it's hard not to know what's going on with you. So to have a diagnosis was um, better than nothing. And because I've become um, such a patient advocate for myself and for others because of it. So I wanna thank you for letting me share a little bit about my journey and I will turn it back over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you, that was so great. So a huge thank you to Laura and Dr. Fran for sharing those presentations. Um, and before we conclude, I do just want to share a few American Lung Association useful resources. Um, so just give me one second and I will pull up that PowerPoint for you guys. Um, okay, so um, so again, thank you both to our great speakers. 
Um, so, and I do just want to touch on the American Lung Association's website, lung.org, has a well of great resources geared towards um, helping patients and their families. So, for example, we have an entire web page dedicated to oxygen therapy, and there are different videos on that page, such as the one you see here, um, that can walk you through how to use different devices and how to get started with oxygen therapy. There are also resources for caregivers who want to support a newly diagnosed patient who may need to begin oxygen therapy. Other examples of what you might find on the website are ample resources and information to help with smoking cessation. Uh, so I do want to highlight on the right um, our program Feed Freedom from Smoking, which is considered one of the most effective smoking cessation programs in the country and is available in a variety of formats. It also includes a comprehensive variety of evidence-based proven effective cessation techniques. We also have web pages with useful tips and tricks for med management. I've included here a downloadable medication tracker, which can help assist patients and their caregiver, caregivers with med management. Uh, there are tons of other resources on there, you know, including questions you might want to ask your pulmonologist and how to prepare for a visit. So I do encourage you to visit lung.org and take a look, kind of pan through and see what's there. You'll probably find something very useful. I also will be sending out all of these resources in addition to other resources that you may find helpful. So stay tuned for that email. And lastly, I just want to highlight a few American Lung Association programs. So first, um, I do want to touch on the Patient and Caregiver Network. So this provides individuals living with lung disease and their families timely support, education, and access to emerging research. Signing up for the network is free. So if you aren't already a member, uh, consider joining today. And also some of my colleagues are popping some links to the resources in the chat. So, and again, like I said, I will be resharing these resources with you, but today you can take a look at what's in the chat. Um, yes, and so the Lung Health Line and the Tobacco Quit Line is a free service that can be accessed via phone or live chat. So that is staffed by licensed registered nurses, respiratory therapists, and certified tobacco treatment specialists that have a wide range of experience in the industry. So they can answer any lung health related questions or connect you with resources. They have bilingual, they have some staff that are bilingual and they also have live language interpretation services as well in over 250 languages. So great resource for you. But, so I wanna also touch on the Better Breathers Club. So the ALA's Better Breather Club Better Breathers Club, sorry, has connected people living with a lung disease to education, support, and each other in communities for around, around the country for over 50 years. Uh, so members can learn about ways to cope with condition, lung conditions while also connecting with others in similar, similar situations. Um, our website uh, can help you find a local Better Breathers Club. There's also pre uh, previously recorded meetings on there as well. So take a look at that um, and try to find a club or browse through some of the other recordings. You might find something really helpful. And lastly, I do wanna talk about our online support communities. So the American Lung Association supports several free online communities through the resource inspire.com. Um, some of these in communities include living with a lung disease and the living with a pulmonary fibrosis community. These uh, resources allow people to participate and connect with each other, share stories. They facilitate peer connection. Um, it's a great experience. It's a great way to share your experience on this online platform. And there's also occasionally some ask the ask the expert um, opportunities as well. So where we will have you know a, a nurse or a doctor on there for a period of time, and it's your opportunity for maybe three days to ask them some questions, and they will do their best to answer. Um, so. Again, like I said, I will send a follow-up email to you that has all these resources and other resources that you might find the most helpful. So stay tuned to that. I also want to touch on the interstitial lung disease webinar being held in October titled Living with an Interstitial Lung Disease. So that is a follow-up to this. So if you're able to please attend and sign up for that. This webinar was also recorded so you can access the recording at another time as well. 
Um, so again, thank you guys. This that concludes our presentation today. Thank you all for being on today, and a huge, a huge thank you to Dr. Fran and Mara for your presentations. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.